What's up guys, back with another educational video and this week we're talking about the obesity crisis. Did we have it all wrong? But first, like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, follow the algorithm. So today I want to do what the fitness with an educational, but it's more on the educational side. A opinion piece came out in the Washington Post on July 28th, written by Dr. David Ludwig. Now, for those who don't know Dr. David Ludwig, he is a researcher at Harvard who has various low carb books and is invested in low carb. You can argue that I'm invested in energy balance, I suppose, because I have an app that helps you track calories and does coaching based off of energy expenditure and these sorts of things. But I also have two low carb settings on this app. So if you wanna say I'm biased, fine, but I'm also gonna bring the receipts, which Professor Ludwig neglected quite a few important pieces of research in his opinion piece. So I've highlighted parts of this and I'm gonna read it verbatim. The usual way of understanding obesity is simple. If you consume more calories than you need to fuel yourself, the surplus is deposited into body fat and you gain weight. Because, according to this approach, all calories are alike to the body, the only way to lose weight is to eat fewer of them or burn off more with exercise. Right away, he's creating a straw man argument out of what energy balance actually is. Energy balance does not say that all calories are equal. Now, first off, it's important to understand that all calories are equal because calorie is simply a unit of measurement. That's like saying the speedometer on your car, some of those miles per hour are different than the other miles. It's just a measurement, okay? Different sources of calories are not created equal and energy balance model says nothing about them having to be all assumed to be the same. In fact, it does not assume that because it takes into account the thermic effect of food, which is greater in higher protein and higher fiber foods. Right away, he completely misrepresents what energy balance actually is, saying that, oh, it just assumes that, you know, all sources of calories are the same, which is, I realize he says all calories are the same, they are, but the implication somehow is that all sources of calories are the same, Therefore, you shouldn't believe this. Then him saying the only way to lose weight is to eat fewer of them or burn off more with exercise. So again, he's kind of creating the straw man argument where the only version of energy expenditure is exercise. That's your physical activity. No, your energy expenditure is not just exercise. And we know that just adding exercise doesn't necessarily fit the problem. And here's why. Exercise can be a portion of your total daily energy expenditure, but the majority of your total daily energy expenditure is from your basal metabolic rate. That's about 60-70% of your total daily energy expenditure for most people. Your NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, is something you can't control, like me fidgeting with my hands and stuff. It's those sorts of movements throughout the day that you don't even think about, you're not conscious and aware of. That actually makes up a significant portion of your total daily energy expenditure as well, probably more so than exercise for most people. And then you have your TEF, your thermic effect of food, and then you have your exercise activity. And we know that if you add exercise, there is some evidence that your body at least partly compensates by reducing your NEAT and also reducing your BMR. Now, typically, the exercise you add is a net benefit. That is, you do have a increase in total energy expenditure, but it's not as much as you would predict. And Herman Ponser's work actually points this out nicely. He shows that for every 100 calories of increased energy expenditure you add from exercise, the net is actually closer to 72 calories because there's 28 that get compensated for somewhere else. So this isn't saying that you just need to do more exercise. What it's saying is that if you become obese, it's because you have consumed more calories than you were expending. But expending doesn't just mean exercise. It also is not calling you lazy, which we'll get back to because he makes that implication later, which is really funny. After a more than three decade increase, calorie consumption in the United States has plateaued or decreased since 2000. What's interesting that he doesn't talk about, you know what else has decreased since 2000? Refined carbohydrate intake and sugar intake, which he claims is the cause of obesity. I'm not sure what his reference is. I'd have to check it out. The references I've seen have said caloric intake has continued to climb over the last 20 years and the activity has continued to decline. Furthermore, he says, in fact, Americans have become somewhat more physically active over the past 20 years, but gives no citation for this. So I'd like to see the receipt for that. Now, what's interesting is he kind of flips things on the switch. You have to understand what he believes in is what's called the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity. There are several versions of this model out there because every time one gets disproven, they move the goalposts so that you can't completely disprove it. By the way, if you sufficiently complicate a model, you can almost never disprove it. 
If your model has such height constraints that it can only be disproven within this narrow window, it's also probably not very robust. So he says, what if the focus on calories and energy balance is simply wrong, reversing the cause and effect? I argue that overeating isn't the primary cause of obesity. Instead, the process of gaining weight causes us to overeat. This is a different model of obesity, the carbohydrate insulin model. This theory puts the blame for rising levels of obesity on the processed, fast digesting carbs that flood our diets during the low fat diet craze, white bread, white rice, breakfast cereals, potato products, and sugary foods. It posits that consumption of these carbohydrates raises insulin levels too high and produces other hormonal changes that program our body to store extra fat. Look at it this way, obesity isn't an overeating problem. Too many calories from each meal being siphoned off into fat tissue. I thought you said calories didn't matter. Too many calories being siphoned off into fat tissue and too few remaining in the blood to satisfy the energy needs of the body. Consequently, our brains make us feel hungrier soon after eating to compensate for those sequestered calories. If we try to ignore hunger and restrict calories, the body conserves energy by slowing metabolism. In this sense, obesity is a state of starvation amid a plenty. What a cool concept, and I'm sure very attractive to people. You aren't fat because you're overeating, you are overeating because you're becoming fat. Except it's been disproven many times over. So first off, let's just go I don't know, directly test the thing we wanna test. So if only we had randomized control trials where we equated calories and protein and varied the amounts of carbohydrate and fat and looked at differences in fat. Oh wait, they've done that. There's over 20 studies doing that. And guess what they found? Almost no difference in fat loss between high carb diets, low carb diets and everything in between when calories and protein are equated between diets. In fact, it actually favored slightly better fat loss in the low fat diets. So that's strike one. I mean, that is a direct test of what you're talking about. Now you could say, well, that's fat loss. We're talking about gaining fat. Okay, cool. There's also inpatient, tightly controlled research where they overfeed either carbohydrate or fat, and they find that both carbohydrate and fat overfeeding are equally fattening. So again, this does not fit with the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity. Then let's just take a step back and look at the mechanisms. So the carbohydrate insulin model basically says when you raise insulin, you drive nutrients into adipose and trap it there. The rest of the body senses that you're low on nutrients and you overeat in response. The problem with that is one, obese people don't have lower levels of circulating nutrients. They actually have higher levels of circulating nutrients like glucose, branched amino acids, free fatty acids, pretty much everything. And in studies where they give drugs that inhibit the release of free fatty acids from adipose tissue, they found that it didn't decrease fat loss. If, if it's an issue of people overeating because fat is trapped in fat cells and you're giving a drug that literally traps fat in fat cells, inhibits the release of it, how could these people lose weight? And finally, in my opinion, the, the most damning evidence to me are the effects of semiglutide. So semiglutide is a GLP-1 mimetic and it has been shown to on average, decrease body weight by about 15% when it's given to obese people. It is the most effective treatment we have for obesity right now on the market. It also significantly increases post-meal insulin secretion. This is completely incongruent with your theory. Your theory is that on a meal-to-meal -meal basis, by driving up insulin, you drive these, thing, you, these drive these nutrients into fat cells, and that causes you to overeat. Semiglutide actually decreases people's energy intake. That's what it does. It works by being an appetite suppressant. This is once again, completely contrary to what you are saying, Professor Ludwig. It is drastically increasing insulin post meal, but the people are not hungry. In fact, they eat less. Now what he'll point out and the way he tries to spin it is he says, well, you know, if you look at the long term, semiglutide increases insulin sensitivity and lowers insulin levels. Yes, because people lose a significant amount of body weight. When people lose significant body weight, and adiposity, they become more insulin sensitive, they decrease their basal levels of insulin. But that only happens because they lost the weight. How do they lose the weight? Well, they lose the weight taking a drug that inhibits their appetite, but also raises their post-meal insulin, which you have literally said should cause them to overeat. It is a direct refutation of your hypothesis. And even when we look at like extreme examples, so there was a study by Serwit et al, where they looked at 12 weeks, I believe it was 12 weeks of weight loss, 
in a group getting over 100 grams of sucrose, refined sugar per day, versus a group getting about 10. They equated calories, they equated protein, they equated macros. The only difference was sucrose intake. Both groups lost the exact same amount of weight. Both groups lost the exact same amount of body fat, and both groups improved all their biomarkers. The only difference was the low sugar group improved their LDL cholesterol just slightly more than the high sugar group, and that's probably because they were eating more fiber, fiber binds to cholesterol, and lowers LDL cholesterol. How could this happen with your model? It should not happen with your model, because your model says calories aren't relevant, even though you talk about depositing calories, which seems strange. It says calories aren't relevant. What's relevant is insulin and refined carbohydrate. So how could somebody eat over 100 grams of refined carbohydrate a day and lose the same amount of body fat as somebody who's not? It is, once again, a direct refutation of your hypothesis. But again, I'm sure he'll just change it and you know, move the goalposts again. So here's one that I really, I really, really want to emphasize here, this quote. He talks about people being resistant to the idea of the carbohydrate insulin model. It's because it's been directly refuted dozens of times. Sorry. One reason for this resistance might be cultural. For centuries, obesity has been viewed as a character flaw. Despite decades of research into the genetic and biological influences on body weight, people with obesity continue to be stigmatized more so than those with almost any other chronic disease, as if their weight were their fault. Energy balance thinking implicitly contributes to these stereotypes by blaming overeating on poor self-control. So let me get this straight, Dr. Ludwig. What you're saying is people have been stigmatized and energy balance contributes to this because it blames them for overeating too many calories. But aren't you just saying they're overeating too many processed carbs? How is that less stigmatizing? You're literally saying, well, you're eating too many processed carbohydrates, too much sugar. How is that less stigmatizing than saying you're eating too many calories? This is an appeal to emotion. It's not an appeal to data. It's not in line with what the data says. And some of his own research refutes what he's saying. I wanna give an example of this. There was a study back in 2018 he was a part of that got a lot of play. And basically, it was a study where they looked at different levels of carbohydrate on energy expenditure. And they measured energy expenditure with doubly labeled water. Well, it has been known for about five years now, maybe even longer, that doubly labeled water will overestimate energy expenditure under low carbohydrate conditions. So sure enough, they showed a big difference in energy expenditure between the lowest intake of carbohydrate and the highest intake. It was like three to 400 calories a day, very substantial. So they, they did all this fancy work with measuring energy expenditure would have been very difficult, very expensive. Why didn't they report body weights? They didn't report body fat either. Like they went through all this trouble to measure energy expenditure. Is it really that difficult to slide a scale under people's feet? Why was that not reported? Because to me, okay, you're showing this difference in energy expenditure. So they, there should be differences in body weights if this is actually real. So why didn't they report it? The second thing is they measured BMR. They measured physical activity with accelerometers. Guess what they found? Zero difference between the groups. So where is this difference in energy expenditure coming from? Because it's probably not neat. It's probably not exercise because they're both wearing accelerometers. It's not basal metabolic rate. So are you trying to say it's from the thermic effect of food? The thermic effect of food accounts for about five to 10% of our daily energy expenditure. So even the most robust estimates of like energy expenditure differences from thermic effect of food would be like 100 or 200 calories. This is way above that. So your data don't make sense with the actual outcome data. And once again, we have dozens of human randomized control trials where protein and calories are equated and people lose the same amount of weight. This is an appeal to emotion and not data. And as we like to say, my friends, data is more important than your feelings. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed the video. Like and subscribe to the channel. Get in there and leave me a comment, and I'll catch you next week.